Hello everybody. Welcome to the NSF Health Sciences question and answer session with our Executive Director and IVDR expert Robin Murant. My name is Howard Broadbridge. I'm responsible for our client relationships at NSF Health Sciences, which is a major international not-for-profit training and consultancy organization that operates in the healthcare sector as well as in the food and water quality sectors. Some of you will already know Robin, but if you don't, Robin was in charge of dossier review for WHO pre-qualification. She was the regulator of IVDs for the Australian TGA and has been the scientist in charge of some of the largest serology laboratories in Australia. With less than two years before the date of application of the new regulations, IVD companies are facing significant challenges in terms of ensuring their quality systems and performance data are in good shape. So we hope this will provide some valuable insights. First of all, before we start the questions, I'd just like to cover a couple of housekeeping points. First, this is a listen only event, so everybody will be on mute for today's session. Second, you can submit additional questions at any time during the session using the questions tab on the control panel to the right of your screen. The slides show where to find the control button, depending on whether you're joining via the GoToWebinar app, via an iPad or tablet, or using a desktop computer or laptop. We'll then collate these and provide answers at a follow-up event. Lastly, please note that today's event will be recorded. What we'll do is just kick off the session with a quick poll to see how the land lies with respect to the difficult issues you're experiencing with implementing the IVDR. You'll see the question in the control panel. Sam, you, I see that you've launched the poll. Please, please poll now. Thank you. So we're just waiting for those polls to come through. About three quarters of you have voted. We're nearly there. Well, that's an interesting, interesting result. We've got uh, we've got about 42% saying that technical documentation presents the biggest challenge. The second one, after well, actually, joint top is is technical documentation and performance evaluation, both at 42%. Uh, and the third issue is is risk management, 13%. And the rest, a small 4% is, is QMS. So technical and doc technical documentation and performance evaluation are, are joint top of, as, the, as the biggest challenges that you face. Okay, um, what we'll do now is, is, is on to the questions. As you can imagine, we've had a lot of questions submitted in advance. So we've picked out the most frequently posed questions for Robin to answer. So the first question, let's, let's have, a, have a look at that. Our company sells a number of Class A products. Our quality management system is ISO 13485 certified, and we don't need the involvement of a notified body. How worried should we be? Robin, over to you. Hello, uh, and hello to everyone. Thank you for dialing in, and I hope today's session is interesting for you. And thank you for everyone who submitted these great questions. You'll see we've got a, a great variety, and most of them really uh, refer to the new IVD regs, but there's a couple that cross both over to the directive as well. Now on this first question, I've been asked this question a number of times, and uh, Class A products are important products for every functioning lab. And as you know, there are no pre-market assessment, there's no pre-market assessment required for a Class A unless it's provided in a sterile state. Thus, you may not feel highly motivated to make all those heavy and necessary changes needed for compliance with the new regs. However, be warned, if there is any problem that attracts re regulatory scrutiny, it will not be a notified body that will come to investigate. It will be a co competent authority. You may consider the risk small, but as someone who has used many Class A IVDs in my lifetime, I do not think that their importance in the overall scheme of a functioning lab should be underestimated. Lab staff also are becoming more aware of the new regs and may well realise that they can approach a competent authority if they have problems. The competent authority will be able to inspect your operation at any time 
including your supply chain, given the new rules with respect to economic operators. So basically, how worried should you be? My advice is don't pay, play roulette, stay legal, become compliant. Thank you. Next question, please. Thanks, Robin. Okay, next question. In the USA, we claimed the single-use pack exemption for UDI due to the size of our devices and the CLSI requirement to store in the original container. Will there be a similar exemption for EU UDI? Robin. Well, in general, it's good to hear that we're now seeing some convergence and the requirements on UDI are comparable to the FDA requirements. If due to the size, it's not possible to carry UDI information, you are not obliged to put them on the device itself, but on the higher package level. And I'm going to read to you some parts from the IVDR so you know exactly what, because there are a few twists you need to know about. So we would need to refer to Annex 6, Part C, and you'll find the required information in sections 4.1 to 4.3 of that annex. And it says, the UDI carrier shall be placed on the label and on all higher levels of device packaging. Higher levels do not include shipping containers. And here's the next point. The next point, which is really salient, is in the event of there being significant space constraints on the unit of use packaging, the UDI carrier may be placed on the next higher packaging level. So there we go. It's good, but listen on. For single use class A and class B devices packaged and labeled individually, the UDI carrier shall not be required to appear on the packaging, but it shall appear on a higher level of packaging, e.g. a carton containing several packages. And here's the but. However, when the healthcare provider is not expected to have access to the higher level of device packaging, and this may be in the case of home, home healthcare settings, the UDI shall be placed on the packaging. So that's the little twist in the tail there that you need to be aware of. So uh, next slide and next question, please. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Okay, next question is in the USA. Products can be cleared for sale via an emergency use authorization. Is there a similar scheme for the EU and how would we go about making an application? Robin. Thanks. All right, so this is a question that I we have uh, lots of times at the moment now with COVID. Um, lots of people are trying to seek some sort of a, a, a light touch regulatory pathway. But unfortunately, well, there is no emergency authorization process in the EU for IVDs, but there is a mechanism that ex exists both in the IVD directive and in the regulation, where it allows for certain re requirements of the regulation, they can be officially bypassed to allow rapid access to a product. And seeing we're currently under the directive, let's refer to Article 9, Section 12 of the directive. And there's some important parts here you need to be aware of. It states, by way of derogation from paragraphs one to four, and, and that's to do with things like uh, conformity assessment and performance uh, testing, uh, the competent authorities may authorize on duly justified request, the placing on the market and putting into service within the territory of the member state concerned of individual devices for which the procedures referred to before have not been carried out and the use of which is in the interest of uh, the protection of health. So there we have it. Uh, and I think this is repeated again, very similar wording in Article 54 of the new regulation. But you'll note that the derogation is decided on a member state basis. So you have to approach wherever you want to place that device. If you have not gone through full conformity assessment, if you may not have finished all your uh, uh, performance trials, but you feel you have sufficient evidence and you feel your device is needed, you need to approach your member state or or the authority in each member state where you want to market that and request derogation. There is a case though that at the moment in the EU, there is a member state wide derogation that the commission has issued for medical devices that support COVID effort, the COVID effort. However, this has not been replicated for IB, IBDs at the moment. So you need to, we still stand at needing to approach each member state. Thank you, Howard. Next question. Next question. Thanks, Robin. Most self-test products are classified as class B or C. Can a product classified as class D also be used as a self-test? Robin. Thank you. Well, indeed it can. And just because it's class D doesn't mean we don't have self-tests for them. 
We already have on the market in Europe, in many member states, CE MART HIV self tests. Uh, so this possibility does not change with the new regs. However, uh, so it, it doesn't matter what the class, B, C or D, it can be for self testing. You'll need the evidence for regardless of the uh, class that it is suitable for use for self testing. And that's probably, that's not an insignificant piece of work to do. And here I'm going to give the however of what you need to be aware of. Uh, so we do now see HIV self-tests, for instance, in many of the member states, but not everywhere. And that's because both in the uh, directive and in the regulation, there's a clause that allows member states to not, not allow access to certain devices. And we'll find that in Article 1 and Section 8 of the new regulation, where it says, this reg regulation shall not affect the right of a member state to restrict the use of any specific type of device in relation to aspects not, not covered by this regulation. So governments still have some say in all this. So uh, you'll find the re uh, for the directive, you'll find the information in the recital 37. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm telling a lie. The, uh, the, I read to you the article one, it was from the directive, both of those quotes from the directive, but there's similar wording in the regulation. My apologies. Uh, yes, thanks, thanks Howard. Thank you. Next, next question. Uh, from your experience of working with a wide range of IBD companies, what would you characterise as the biggest challenge facing them when preparing for the application of the IBDR? In particular, in terms of steps towards the implementation of IBDR in, IBDR in the EU, do you believe that patients will be better served shortly after the full application of the new regulations? Okay. So, uh, biggest challenges. Obvious one is access to a notified body. And remember, you have to find one that has expertise for your device. Notified bodies are designated according to the expertise they hold, and these are matched to notified body codes. You need to find a notified body which has designations for the codes that might apply to your device. Probably only a few of the large notified bodies will co have coverage of all the co codes, so that makes it a little bit tricky. Secondly, but possibly much more importantly, is the cost of compliance. Many IVDs are small and medium enterprises and the cost, of, the cost implications of bringing tech files, new roles and legal responsibilities into line with the new regs are enormous. The situation is both real and dire. And as for whether it's all worth it at the end of the day, do I think that uh, uh, this patients will be better served? I've never heard anyone disagree with the intent of the new regulations. They're tough. But I think if we all survive the transition period, then yes, I believe that patients will be better served. That, that was a very interesting question. Thank you, whoever sent that in. Thanks, Robin. Next question. Okay, does the uh, PRRC, the, the person responsible for regulatory compliance, always need to be on site? Well, no, they don't. They don't need to be on site, but they all need to be readily available for consultation provision of advice and certain statutory re responsibilities. As we are informed in Article 15 of the new regs, micro and small enterprises are not required to have the PRRC within their organisation, but shall have such person permanently and continuously at their disposal. Likewise, the authorised rep shall have permanently and continually at their disposal at least one person responsible for regulatory compliance. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Next question, please. Our company's products are sometimes used off-label by the labs that buy them. What are the ramifications of that under the IVDR, Robin? Ah, okay, so firstly, if you know this is happening, then this should be reflected in your risk assessment because it's, for, uh, it's foreseeable misuse and you make, must take measures take, to ameliorate this risk. And this may be in the means of warnings on labels and things like that. However, it has big consequences for the labs who for the first time are being recognized in the reg as manufacturers, albeit in-house manufacturers. Certain labs will be exempt from meeting all the requirements of the regulation if they qualify to be considered a health institution. 
But if they're not, they're going to have to meet all, if they're, and if they're using your product off-label, then they're going to be considered a full, uh, like a commercial manufacturer and have to meet all the requirements. And the different responsibilities are addressed in Article 5 of the new reg, if you want to read it up. So, but regardless of whether a lab qualifies for this health institution exemption or not, each lab that is use, using a test off-label and, and therefore making it an in-house test must hold evidence that the GSPRs, the general safety and performance requirements, have been met. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, Robin. Next question, sir. Next question is, I have heard a lot about the new requirements for economic operators. What are the most significant of these? Robin? Okay, well, uh, economic operators, as everyone knows, includes manufacturers, uh, authorised representatives, importers and distributors. So we, we, most of us know about the new requirements for manufacturers. So let's dive in and look at a, a, some of the, not all, but some of the new requirements for the others. So at a minimum, authorised representatives' obligati obligations include verifying that the EU Declaration of Conformity and technical documentation have been drawn up and, where applicable, that an appropriate conformity assessment procedure has been carried out by the manufacturer. The authorised representative will be liable for defective devices together with the manufacturer if the manufacturer has not comp uh, complied with, the, with its obligation under the regulations. Now let's go to what the importer has to do. They're responsible for making sure that the devices they place on the market bear the CE mark, are accompanied by the required information and labelled in accordance with the regulation and have been assigned a UDI where applicable. In addition, the importer should verify that devices are registered in Udemed. Importers should make sure that storage and transport conditions when under their responsibility do not jeopardise compliance. They shall indicate on the device or its packaging or in a document accompanying the device, their name and other uh, details of their business. Distributors should verify that the devices have been CE marked, that an EU declaration of conformity has been drawn up and that labels and instructions for use are provided in the official languages of the member state in which the device is made available. Distributors should also verify that the importer's name is indicated on each device or in the accompanying documentation and that the device bears a UDI. So, and like an importer, distributors shall ensure that storage and transport conditions when under their responsibility are appropriate and in line with the recommendations of the manufacturer. So these are, these are the high level requirements, there's a number more. So if you are a manufacturer, you need to make sure that all your legal agreements uh, are, have incorporated these requirements for all, each of your economics operators. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Next question, please. Next question, in Robin, is what is the extra technical documentation required for IVDs that contain material of biological origin or has a me measuring function? Okay, great question. Uh, technical documentation for IVDs that contain material of biological origin may be quite varied in its nature. Ideally, use of materials that are of risk should be avoided in the design where possible. Sometimes, however, it's not possible to replace these materials. So you need to have a justification for their use and it may be based on the very low risk profile of the material and that in conjunction with the design of the IVD that it is very highly unlikely that this material of biological origin will come in contact with the use of or, or patient. So that sort of a justification could be part of your technical documentation. It also may be uh, information proving that it has been tested by the state-of-the-art methods for major blood-borne diseases, or that if it is of bovine or ovine origin, that it has been sourced from a TSE-free herd. Uh, if this latter case, a relevant certificate can be used as evidence. Now let's talk about IVDs with the me measuring function. And these are IVDs where results are expressed in SI units. And the GSPR tells us, let's go to there to see what we're required to do with when we, if we have a device with a measuring function and then think about what the tech docs should include. 
and it tells us that devices having a primary analytical measuring function shall be designed and manufactured in such a way as to provide appropriate analytical performance, taking into account the intended purpose of the device. So appropriate analytical performance is that which delivers clinical benefit, which is defined for us in Recital 64 as providing accurate medical information. So you need to generate evidence that will show that it, your SI units are accurate and medical, medical information. So it's information that can be used that is clinically relevant, that any of your, uh, your repeatability, your uh, limited detection, whatever it is that you're measuring in the SI unit is of a clinical, clinically useful, uh, in a clinically useful range and is accurate. So use of international reference material or other metrological traceable, metrologically traceable material in defining analytical performance can assist in the development of suitable technical documentation for such devices. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. Uh, next question, Robin, is uh, I have heard a lot about the new requirements for economic operators. What are the most significant of these? Oh, Howard, I think this looks as if uh, we've repeated this one, and I'm sorry about that. I think that was my fault. Okay, okay. Next question is, uh, professional use only IBDR technical files. What is the best way to organise the technical documentation? Uh, also, is it acceptable to group multiple device types, PCR, FIA, etc., into one technical file folder because they detect the same antigen? Or is it best to organise them according to how the NB will review for sampling? Robin. Okay, well, uh, this is the, my advice I give everyone, and I think it is always to think of what happens when your application comes to a notified body. Notified body staff are under a high level of pressure to undertake enormous workloads while assessing to a very high standard. As such, the best thing in my books is to organise it in a manner that will make their time efficient. Don't make them waste time trying to find out, find out how your filing system works. Use the one that we have in the regs. And we have a filing system defined for us in Annex 2 and 3 of the new regs. Cross-reference clearly and make sure any links will work for them, not just when the documents sit within your own system. So always put yourself in the, in the seat of the assessor with your technical documentation and think how they will be looking at things and give them what will be, make sure your evidence is easy to find. The best evidence, if it's hidden in a badly organised uh, system, will may be lost and never seen. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, Robin. Uh, we may have time for one, one more question. We've got a couple of things to say at the end. Um, next question is, it has been suggested that a lot of manufacturers of IVDs are going to be left with fairly empty dossiers and will not know how to deal with a notified body. Many in this field are SMEs. If there were three priorities you could highlight for manufacturers who are relatively unfamiliar with the process, what would they be? All right, so always make sure first that senior management really understands that this is a regulation impacting the whole of their business. Empty dossiers are only half of the problem. Uh, we know that there's a whole lot of new requirements. Engage with the notified body immediately. Start work immediately with the gap analysis of your technical documentation. Use risk management to assess the gaps. But if you've, if you've been, one thing I always warn everyone is if you've relied on evidence generated to uh, support an FDA 510K, remember that demonstration of substantial equivalence is not the basis for compliance in the EU. So what you have may not be good enough. See what data you're, but, you, so you may have a lot of technical gaps that need filling, but don't feel you have to rush out and do expensive clinical trials. See what data your lab-based users have, and uh, because they hold a lot of good quality, real-world data that may be suitable for use. And finally, don't overestimate, underestimate the workload ahead. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um... Next question, what would your advice be to a startup looking to launch a totally new IVD device in the EU at present? Okay, oh, and I have a lot of clients who are startups and I think they have a great advantage. 
uh, they can assure that systems and documentations are compliant from day one, and they don't have the hard journey of bringing all historic procedures into line with new regulation. I guess some of this applies to also to a mature, a mature manufacturer producing a new IVD. Understanding what is required and getting it right from the start is the best measure. Seek help if you need. That's also uh, a case. Uh, I have a, I'm a consultant to a number of very large manufacturers. They don't underestimate that it's complicated. The other, the other piece of advice in starting early and, and that, you know, the fact you are an advantage as a startup that you don't have to, that you will be, have the, you have the opportunity to get it right from the beginning is also make sure you don't defer risk management. That should be part of the life cycle of your device. And as soon as you've started to get it to produce a, a, a device that looks like it's the one you're going to go with and or, or that looks as if it has promise, start implementing risk management from that moment. It's going to save you a lot of time and headache and heartache downstream. Thank you. Thank, um, thanks, Robin. Um, Sam, is that the last question? I'm not sure. Do we have any others on, on the slides? No, that's fine. Um, I've got one uh, further question, Robin, before we finish. Um, we're approaching our time limit, but before we end, I've got a question that no doubt many of you have in the back of your minds, and it's whether or not you think the IVDR application date will be postponed, uh, as has happened with the uh, the MDR. What do you think about that, Robin? Yes, oh, well, uh, I guess it's the million dollar question that we're all wondering. Um, what will happen and of course industry and uh, medtech europe and others are really lobbying hard advocating very hard that there will be a delay because so much of the uh, infrastructure required for the ivdr is still a long way from being in place we're missing a lot of guidance we're missing uh, many parts udemand is still not functioning and so there's a lot of good reasons it should be delayed but the process of getting a delay passed uh, into law is more than just getting the European Commission to agree. It then has to be taken through the European Parliament. And even though I think there's a possibility that the Commission could be persuaded, I'm not 100% sure the Parliament will be persuaded. The problem is that COVID has shown us that the current directive has too many, uh, isn't tight enough to assure quality products are on the market. We have many IVDs that work well, but we have many more that have been shown to be time and time again suboptimal and they're self-declared. And having these products on the market has actually wasted precious resources that should be put into diagnosis and helping patients. So I think it's going to be a big push to get the parliament, which is made up of a different set of people from, from every member state, to agree to a delay. That's my fear. Uh, and I can see the reasons for it. Uh, so I just think everyone has to be ready for March, uh, for May 26, 2022, and not assume there will be a further delay of the regulation. Thanks, Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. That's, that's great advice. Um, we're approaching our time limit, but just before we go, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we do have uh, an IVDR, IVDR app, uh, and that app is uh, free to download. So there's the, the, you can see the information there on the screen about that app. Um, thank you everybody for attending. We hope that it's been, uh, it's been useful. And uh, as, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, this will be recorded and will be available for, uh, for re-listening to in the future. Um, also, we'll provide contact details for follow-up in case anybody would like to uh, put some individual questions to Robin um, after this uh, session. So thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you for joining.